Good morning, Lake Shore. How's everybody doing? That's great. Let's try that one more time. Pretend that you're awake. Good morning, Lake Shore. How's everybody doing? That's what I love. Makes my heart feel happy. Good morning and welcome here to the Rising Stars of Western New York. My name is Stephen Dawson and I'm going to be the captain of entertainment for you this evening. That's right, I am the Ahab to your Ishmael, the Kirk to your Spock, the child protection worker to your Britney Spears. <laughs> That's right, and we're going to have a blast. They're closing the curtain right now on this incredible band. Why don't we show them some love, the Pyramid Dance Band back there. <laughs> All right, guys, the curtain's closed. <laughs> but uh, when I first heard that I was going to be performing with the Pyramid Dance Band, I obviously assumed that it was going to be a band of crime-fighting cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it turned out that I'm performing with the band that actually played at the building of the pyramids. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to suggest that they're old, but if you're looking for their CD, I suggest looking in the dinosaur rock bin which is reserved for bands that actually used to throw rocks at dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, oh, come on, that was funny. People love dinosaurs too much. Don't make fun of dinosaurs. My cousin was a dinosaur. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Get over it. Yeah, but they're going to be here all night, which for them is until Wheel of Fortune is over. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. You know, it's great to be back here in Lakeshore, especially on such a, a, a great event. You know, I've been uh, out of town for a couple of years, and coming back into town was an interesting experience because I started to really notice all the names on the signs of the businesses in Derby on my way up here. You know, I drove by uh, Militello Tires, Pasquale's Pizza, Catalano Motors. It's an awful lot of Italians. <laughs> you know, I had no idea that North Buffalo had slid so far south. I actually heard that they're thinking of moving the Italian festival to Route 5. <laughs> That'll be fun. And instead of the Walmart, they actually want to put in a giant uh, Grecio's Bakery. <laughs> That'll be tasty. <laughs> but I, I told you guys I've, uh, I've been out of town. I've actually been living in New York City for the past couple of years. And New York City's a great city, you know, but it's a strange city, you know. Hardly anybody who lives there is actually from the city. So inevitably, every time you meet someone new, they ask you, where are you from originally? And for the first couple of years, I would tell people, I'm from Derby. To which they generally respond, is that in Kentucky? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, once a year it's in Kentucky. The rest of the year we live in roller rinks. <laughs> Moron. <laughs> so after a couple of years of trying to explain that there could be a place called Evangola, I just started telling people I was from Buffalo. <laughs> to which they would respond, Buffalo, oh, snow. <laughs> yeah, we have snow there. Huh, big surprise. I try to educate people, though. You know, I try to tell them it's not as bad as it looks on the Weather Channel. We just know that at least once a year, our sidewalks are going to be shoveled by the National Guard. <laughs> But I tend, to get, I tend to get really defensive about my hometown, you know? So I, I instantly ask them back. I say, all right, well, where are you from originally? Oh, well, I'm from Arkansas. Oh, inbred. <laughs> that and you gave us the Clintons. Thanks for that, moron. <laughs> but uh, living in New York was interesting, especially after 9-11, because the whole city kind of changed. You know, there was this, this kind of feeling of brotherhood and this spirit of kinship that was very mm, un-New York. Yeah. It had gotten to the point where people were smiling at each other. People would open the cab door for you. Oh, by all means, you're in a rush. I even once saw a gang member have his picture taken with a New York police officer in Times Square. It was like bizarro Manhattan. But the other day, I was actually in Times Square, and I saw this taxi cab come spinning around a corner and nearly kill this construction worker. And the construction worker jumped up back on his feet. He started screaming very inappropriate things at the cab driver. And then he showed him where Mr. Tallman was. And the cab driver leaned out, and in a language I know wasn't English, but I think was inappropriate, 
he showed his Mr. Tall Man to the cab driver. And then their eyes met. And I saw a tear form in the construction worker's eye. And a tear form in the cab driver's eye. And everything in Times Square just stopped. Because we all realized in that moment that our city was healing. <laughs> it's a day at a time. One mugging one day at a time. But uh, I don't know if it was like this in Buffalo, but in New York City this winter, w the weather was insane. Was it like that here? It's crazy. I mean, in the middle of December, it was so hot that I was able to go to the beach. But then the very next day, it was so cold that everywhere I went, Morgan Freeman was narrating my journey. <laughs> like I was a penguin. But I'll tell you, the weather has turned me into a believer. When it comes to global warming, I now believe. Not just a believer, I'm a fan. I like everything about global warming. So much so that I'm starting to save my pennies to buy a Humvee. I just recently switched back to aerosol hairspray. <laughs> and last week I challenged Al Gore to a fist fight. <laughs> That's right, I plan to give him an inconvenient uppercut. <laughs> the only thing that I, re that I don't like about global warming is that everybody wants to blame it on people. Like it's our fault with all this pollution and overpopulation. Like, come on, you can't blame us for being successful. It's like blaming bees for making too much honey. Just so happens that our honey is greenhouse gas and CO2 emissions. <laughs> but I think if you want to blame anyone, I think we should put the blame where it belongs, on predators. Oh, that's right, I said it. The furry meat eaters of the food chain. Because it is the predator's job to thin out our population. When's the last time you heard about a predator doing its job? No, okay, there was that lion in San Diego that ate that kid. But if we examine that, that kid had been shooting that lion for a half an hour in the face with a slingshot. Now, I'm a vegetarian, but if a kid shot me in the face with a slingshot, I'd bite him in the throat, too. <laughs> that one doesn't count. But then, all right, there was that Siegfried and Roy thing, too, right? But that guy didn't even die. <laughs> what kind of a tiger can't kill a gay magician? It just seems that unless you're willing to take a sharp, pointy stick and put it into a grizzly bear's eye, predators are going to leave you alone. Which brings me to one of two conclusions. Either predators have grown lazy, or human beings have evolved into something that tastes like poop. <laughs> but either way, I think that the solution is obvious. What we need are dragons. I'll explain. Just a couple hundred missile-proof mythological predators to come swooping up the back of the herd and nip off the slow ones. Because, friends, one look at Congress and you'll realize the slow ones are out of control. And the dragons will take care of them because dragons are like the little Mikey of the food chain. They'll eat anything. Even NASCAR fans. Do, you, do we have any NASCAR fans here? Anybody? No? Good, then I can use my big words. <laughs> <laughs> I just recently watched my first NASCAR game for the first time. I don't even know if you call it a game, the race. I watched my first NASCAR race for the first time. And I, maybe it's just me, but when did driving a car become a sport? Right? All I saw was a bunch of rednecks turning left. I felt like I was watching the Olympics for billboards. You know, with all the advertising on the cars, I felt like I was watching commercials and fast forward. Like, mm, Budweiser, McDonald's, Snickers. Budweiser, McDonald's, Snickers. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the advertising works, though, because by the end of the race, I gained 10 pounds, lost a tooth, and pickled my liver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one look at the rest of NASCAR Nation, and I knew I was not alone. <laughs> which gave me an idea. What I think that NASCAR needs are public service announcement cars. 